Hello, this is Will Faber from Art to Ride, and today we're looking at a second submission by Carol of the Horse Sky. Sky, to refresh our memories, is a 17-year-old paint. She just started doing this work uh, about a month before this. She sent in the first video. She's been doing this for a couple of months. And uh, all I can say is already what a huge improvement we see over the last video that you sent in. All of this is just going so much better the horse is really starting to stretch into the contact. It's gotten so much more active. You've done a really great job of getting the horse to move away from you. Your, your work in hand here is so much better. Um, the horse pretty much the last time we saw it was pretty upside down still. And you can see as this horse comes into silhouette, we can see the kind of shape this horse's back is in. So this horse has been hollow for a very long time in its life. You can see that bump there on the top of its hips. Once again, that's the beginning of kissing spine. From that, it just deteriorates on down. But once again, if you do this work correctly, you can um, basically undo all of that, you know, unless the damage is too far gone. But it usually is not. If they're as sound as this horse is, you can usually turn them around with no trouble whatsoever, So, which you're already well on the way of doing. So really good here. The activity of the walk is so much better. The horse is just tracking much more better up underneath itself. It still can get a little more active than it is here, and you do as, as time goes on here. But even, even there, look how nice the horse starts to swing and really starts to stretch. Now this is a horse, you know, that is, and of course these are the kind of horses that really do need this work because they're very straight behind. Um, they're not built with a lot of flexion in their hocks, and some of the older ones um, just literally had none at all. Um, and those are the kind of horses that are very difficult. And at the same time, they they need the dressage more than, than the other ones because it's so everything is so difficult for them. But you've done a great job with this one. Now, this one is not as straight as what I'm talking about there, but uh, you will be able to improve this a great deal with this work that you're doing here. When this horse actually starts to move the way it will be able to, when that big dip in its back there and that big belly hanging down there is gone, you'll see quite a good mover here once it's all coming together. You have to just remember when you start horses like this, you know, and we see horses that are in this bad of shape as three and four years old even these days. Here in California, people raise horses in backyard pens and then wonder why they fall apart when they put them with a trainer for their 90 days of training, right? Uh, because they're just like couch potato children. They haven't done anything, you know. No one should ever raise a horse in a 50 by 50 corral or something like this. I mean, see those big grass pastures over there in the back of this video? That's what it should look like where you raise horses. I mean, otherwise they just... Uh, they start out at such a deficit because they've been basically standing still. They're couch potato horses, as I said, like children who've never gotten off the couch. So certainly if you're raising horses, that's something you really have to think about. And there are things that you can do, you know, like uh, be sure you feed them off of the ground, if nothing else, and, you know, move their hay around all over the place so they have to walk a little bit to get it, even if you have your horse in a small pen. But this is so much better. This horse is going to turn around and just be absolutely fantastic for you. And this is just the kind of thing we like to see. And once again, improves over and over again um, how much this system, the correct system, works to train horses. You know, and you just have to remember, too, all of this controversy about, you know, what is the correct way to train horses and all this kind of stuff. You know, I think people figured that out at the height of... Uh, of equestrianism, so to speak, you know, in the early part of the 20th century. Um, they had gone through all those changes. And unfortunately, World War II was this kind of gap. They had just, you know, really gotten it with, with riders like Nuno Oliveira and Egan von Neindorf, you know, really had developed this system that you see here that we're doing of stretching the horses, getting them working. That's what it meant to be round. They were the few riders in the world who talked about that. But once you realize how being round is, you know, is something we can do, it's really therapeutic if you want to look at it that way. And that's the basis for, you know, when people talk about dressage being natural. Well, that's the most natural thing is to develop them correctly. So that was really, really good work. A huge improvement for only one month before. Uh, and you just looked, you know, much more like you knew what you were doing. You had a handle on the job. The horse wasn't just drifting around all over the place. So really, really wonderful work there. And here we go right into the lunging work, and I'm seeing the same thing here in terms of, uh, I mean, if you go and compare this with what I saw a month ago, and I highly recommend that you all do as I did. I'm, when I go and see the next video, I go remind myself of what the last one was like. And, you know, this one is, is entirely different. So this is really wonderful. You've come a really long way, and you've really gotten this horse swinging over its back. And that's the hard part. Once you get that, getting a horse to, over its back, 
is the hardest thing you'll ever learn to do in writing. But once you do, though, everything else is easy because it's all based on that. It's all that never losing that feeling of the horse being over its back, which makes the horse simply able to do the things that we ask it to do relative to how much it has developed in that frame. Now, this is just absolutely wonderful. You know, this horse already looks like a different horse than what we saw in the first video. Absolutely wonderful. Now, look how different this horse looked. I mean, this horse's neck looks at least a foot or two longer than it did in the last video. And look how that walk is now swinging. And this is only 30 days, folks, of doing this work. Now, sometimes it takes us even longer than that to achieve this. You know, many of you are starting with horses, you know, once again, that really are rehab projects. You know, especially the, the very older ones, you know, that we have to be careful with. Like bringing a person back. You know, you can't just throw an old horse and think, oh, well, now we're just going to go to the gym and work like a 20-year-old. It doesn't work that way. You know, when you're rehabbing horses, our people, you must go very slowly through the process and really be sure that they develop the right set of muscles. All really good. This is such an improvement over the last one. Be a little more active there. See how much more that... Now look at this horse's hocks, how they're moving now. You wouldn't even know this was the same horse that we saw in the first video. Look at the flexion in the hocks now, people. There's almost... He's even almost starting to push off the ground a little bit. Not quite yet, but at least he's swinging under the ground and, you know, and lifting herself forward a little bit. And even when you come back to the walk, now this horse, when we first saw it, literally had that look of just kind of fence post back legs. But you've come a really long way in 30 days. That's really great. This is really good activity coming back to this walk. You're keeping yourself in a good position. Now what I would do there pretty soon, well, you know, once the horse wants to stretch a little deeper and you feel like that stretch is consistent, go ahead and take those side reins that you have on. That looks like you just have the reins hooked back there. But I almost looked for a minute like they were restricting, like the horse wanted to go a little lower than they were letting it go. So I would do away with those completely now. Now once in a while I do suggest people do put on side reins. Um, if you have horses that have been upside down their entire lives, that they will, you know, this is very hard for them to understand. So putting long side reins on with a long shambone can really kind of help them a little bit in the sense they just they tend to relax into the contact a little better and they can't evade the shambone by twisting their head sideways so it kind of straights them out and gets them sort of focused on stretching down and forward but as soon as I get them to stretch down and forward then I would just take that off See right there, I think the horse could even go lower than those side reins are letting it go. Though they're pretty long, but I think I, I think I'd go ahead and, and try it without them and see what that happens, or just try to get a little more length in them yet. But look at the difference in this horse's walk. When we first saw this horse, it had that you know I'm stuck in flypaper kind of walk about it. Now it's really starting to swing. This is going to be a great one to develop uh, um, and watch progress over time. And look at the back as she comes around there. You know, she's right. She's pretty much using everything she can use right now in terms of her top line. But as that develops, you're going to see so much more lift and reach through. Even her belly right here. And I just noticed how her belly just came up a little bit right then. All of a sudden, I saw her engage a little more through her abs. Notice as she comes around here that she doesn't look so quite so pendulous in the belly. See what I'm talking about? That she has pulled up a little bit. I think she'll even do more so in a few minutes. Now that canter is still pretty stiff and hollow, so you can see that isn't something we'd want to do a lot of. You want to just come right back to the trot after that. I, I would say the source is really just not ready to canter yet. But it's perfectly fine to try, you just don't keep cantering. If you see that the canter is disorganized and, you know, uh, looks like the wheels are flying off, which is what that canter did, and the back was hollow, then you just want to bring the horse right back to the trot. You know, nothing hurt by trying. But you just wouldn't want to keep doing it, because all you'll end up with is a very sore horse. Remember, the faster you go, the harder everything we do is on the horse's legs. 
So once again, remember when the horse is not over its back, it has no shock absorbers. So basically all of that concussion, that's why they look, look so stiff-legged when you do that. So, so that was really a good lunge, really good work in hand, and now we come to the, work, the riding work, and uh, this is just really great. Compared to what I saw 30 days ago, this is right on track. Certainly looks like a beautiful countryside. I'm not sure where Carol and Skye are there. But looks like good horse country. Your position looks good here, and I like even right there how you lifted up and got a little behind the motion. That's really good. Getting a feel for what that does is really important. That was an excellent moment for you right there. And just understand that's just how you do it. You lift up and you open that chest upwards. And you kind of lighten your seat a little bit while you bring the horse up with your legs. And then it brings it back uh, up underneath you. And once you feel the ball like you're getting here, look at this walk. This is at, you know, there is no, actually, this is 100 times better. This is a walk. And what you had before was not a walk. So, you know, uh, now you have an actual walk. And look at this horse swing. I mean, compared to the last video we saw, this is amazing. You've done a really great job. And what I just saw back there, the way you lifted up and brought that horse through from your leg, shows me that you're already developing a really good feel for this. Remember, folks, that's what we're trying to do. If we're trying to get the back to come up, that's what's wrong with so much teaching today. They teach riding as if there is only one position that we ride in. And that is just not true at all. There's many, many positions we ride in, including a forward seat and a half seat. And a, but when the horse's back is up is the only time we can sit directly on top of it with our weight and just let all of our weight down. You know, we can keep our weight off the horse a little bit by closing the top of our thighs, and that's exactly what we do when we want to really, uh, get the horse to lift up, and we bring our shoulders back like a yoga stretch and activate the horse with our legs, so we're actually lightening the seat. We're giving the horse somewhere to go, and then when we feel that the horse will literally fill up the seat to us, then we just simply relax our legs and you can sit on it. Simple as that. <clears throat> and you actually just did it. Now, while I say it's simple, as you all know, it's, it's uh, quite difficult to learn that timing. So, but, uh, so you, that shows me a lot that you've picked up a lot from watching the videos from being able to do that. So we just don't want to get stuck. It's why you all say, uh, well, you don't guys talk about your position much. Well, you know, because riding is not a static thing. Now, that's how beautiful this walk is swinging out here. You know, your riding position will develop as you develop your horses. And because you will not be able to develop the horses correctly unless you learn to sit correctly, which is not one static position. So that's why it has to be learned in dynamic motion. And that's what's so wrong with so much riding in every a sport today, is they're teaching you this is the one thing you do, and you lock into this one position, and this is what it's all about, holding this position. Well, nothing could be further from the truth. Look how beautiful this walk is here. Now, this horse, literally, its neck, it, well, it's again, the whole entire horse looks like a different horse. So you have really done a wonderful job here. Look how big and swinging that walk is. Really great. You know, and the next time you see somebody who see it says they're a, you know, somebody touts as, as often people will say to me, oh, well, he's a championship rider, as it's been quoted to me many times. Well, you know, when you're at a championship where everybody rides the same way, which is badly, whoever's the best of the worst, and this is what's led to so much training, bad training in America, you know, it's because people have valued nothing but whether or not they won ribbons at horse shows, you know, that being the validation for all. But, you know, the problem is that if everybody does it wrong at the horse show, somebody still wins first, second, third place, or whatever the case may be, however hand, ribbons they're handing out. And they hand them out, you know, a lot of ribbons these days. So everybody goes home with a, hand, with a handful. So we all feel like we are, we are all successes. However, if you look in the eyes of many of those horses, you'll see uh, <laughs> at what great expense their, all their successes come. Really nice here. Look how nice and swinging this is. So this is literally a transformed horse since your first video. And rider. Everything about what you did here today, you looked very, very businesslike. Uh, you had your posture correct, your position here. And as I said, talking about position, you just have to let your... Now one thing is you have to have a saddle to start with that lets you sit in the right position. And you have to be fit enough to sit in the right position. So you just have to take all those things in consideration. 
but you never want to just hold yourself and force yourself in a position. It's like yoga, you know, you want to engage the muscles, but they're still soft and relaxed, as opposed to making them tense, like you're trying to make your bicep pop out or something, which makes you very stiff. But you have developed a really beautiful position here already. Now, as we see, as we've gone from the walk to the trot, that obviously the horse is not as prepared to do the trot work here, but compared to what we saw before, already it's starting to reach out. I mean, this is just a whole different trot than what I saw the last time. You can see how the legs are at least swinging. Now, this horse needs to stretch a lot more than it is, but even here, the legs are pretty much starting to swing in unison, even though the horse hasn't even stretched all the way down. It's pretty close. But you can see how this horse, if you look closely, when the horse is hollow, you can literally see it grab the ground with its front foot and pull itself along. And once again, as you watch the horses go down and down and become deeper, that's what frees up what frees up the front is the fact that the back end starts doing the work, and that's the whole point of riding. We have to get the back end doing the work for this to be uh, safe for both us and the horse. You know, just last week there was another young rider flipped over on and killed, and it's just. It's all because of the same thing. They're riding these horses upside down, and when they get in trouble, they're taught to hang on to the reins, and that just brings the horse right over on top of you. The most important thing you'll ever learn is to ride with a light rein and to let that rein go the minute you feel that the horse is starting to fall or something like that. You must just slip the reins through your hands. So that's why it's so important to learn to ride like this for your safety because that's what happens. If your horse starts to fall and you don't let go, the front end gets buried and the back end comes over on top of you and that's when people get killed. So if only people would know, I mean, I'm hearing all these organizations, you know, they even write to me and complain about uh, that I don't wear helmets in some of my videos. But I'd say there'd be a lot more people dead today if no one wore a helmet and everyone rode their horses over their backs. So that's where real safety comes from, is riding a horse that, that you can actually trust the way this one is going to trust you and is already. So once again, I'd say about that trot, it's almost there. You did the right thing of not doing too much of it. You came back to a walk. It, it got some. It got pretty nice, I mean, relatively speaking, but it still got some deeper stretch to go, and you did just the right thing by doing about that much and coming back to the walk. Let's look at this beautiful walk. Just never forget that you can develop a horse. Once the horse is over its back, it's developing no matter what you're doing with it, walk, trot, or cantering, if it's over its back. And it's doing it in a way that doesn't harm it. Like good exercise should be for anyone. But just think about all these children that are, you know, forced into these, like, uh, what do they call it, Friday night tykes or whatever, where, you know, at five and six years old, these kids are going out and getting concussions. You know, they've had five concussions by the time they're ten. You know, that, you know, once again, all the studies have shown what happens when you do that. So... Yes, there's things that we can do, but should we? That's always the question. Like riding an upside-down horse. Yes, you can do it, but should you? And the answer is no. So here we see the same thing on the other side of the trot work. It's just not quite ready to be there, but it's trying to be. There you go, like that, and you get a little bit. And of course, that's what you want to do. As soon as you just get a little bit, just be satisfied with a little. The greatest quote in all of riding theory is, ask for a lot, be satisfied with a little, and reward often. Even Mr. Oliveira, Oliveira uh, would cite that quote all the time. It was Capitan Boudon who wrote Exterior and Haute Cole, outside and indoor riding. And there you get a little bit of stretch. So this is definitely coming. It's not quite there yet, so you wouldn't want to do too much of this, and you don't. And that's just the right thing to do. But compared to what we saw 30 days ago, this, the trot is transformed. The entire horse is transformed, really. And that would be about it if you can't get the stretch in that time after you're doing just the right thing by coming back to the walk and do the work that you can do correctly and build the muscle that you can build. And you can build a lot of muscle just doing nothing but walking correctly. And if you want to little, add a little challenge to that, you know, you can always walk over a pole or you can walk over some Cavaletti. Uh, I will do some more things on Cavaletti here very soon. 
I've done one or two, I think, on the website there. But the main key, just like everything else, is a horse must be working over its back. Yes, Cavaletti are good for horses. Going up hills and down hills are good for horses, but only if the horse is working over its back when you're doing it. So that's the caveat you have to put on all this stuff. Just because you trot over poles with the horse upside down, what that really means is you you have a very good chance of stepping on one of the poles and breaking the horse's coffin bone, which I have seen happen at least 10 times in my life. So, you know, the horse has to see where it's going. Just how dangerous it is to jump, to try to jump horses, you know, with their heads either exaggeratedly between their knees or either back on top, you know, where they're looking through the bottoms of their eyes all the time. Those are the horses that jump rather wildly. Beautiful walk here again. This has just been a fantastic ride and a transformation from what I saw just 30 days ago. So keep up the great work. This is going to be a really fun horse to watch develop because you already have it over its back. You know, at least at the walk. And I think you'll have it over its back. The way you're going here, I expect the next time I see this, you're going to be right on track. And once again, I want everybody to look at her position. What a beautiful position already this young lady has. Or as I say, young lady, I'm not actually sure how old this person is. Maybe they'll tell us in the, in the, next, uh, in the next video or in their next email. But really great job. And that's what you want to do. You want to stretch up, you want to stretch your upper body up, and you want to let your legs relax down and just lift up your toe and let your leg hang out, let your toes go out to whatever angle is natural for your body as it wraps around the horse. You never try to turn your toes forward. That's really all there is to the position. It's quite simple. And stretch up and just sit squarely on the bottom of your seat bones, not, not with your hips too far under you or too far back like with an arch back. Just like good posture with a horse between your legs. And you're starting to achieve that already, so that's really great. And then as you do this work, what happens in the classical system is the work guides you to the correct position. And because we're never holding on against the horse's mouth, you're having to actually learn how to balance. Nor are we holding on to the saddle, a strap on the saddle, or onto the mane, or something like this. So, you know, you must have developed at least this much balance, you know, to do this work. You have to think of, you know, riding, uh, you'll hear me talk about waves. Well, beginners usually start on horses that are upside down, the way this one was. It's kind of like a wave. When you learn to surf, you learn to surf after the wave is already broken. But it's actually very hard to stand up on the board because the wave has lost, all, or at least a lot of its energy. Same thing is true of horses. It takes a little more athletic person to ride a horse that's working over its back which is why it became popular to, you know, to develop these breeds that had no movement in their back. That's the whole point of saddle breads and pasafinos and all of these uh, little gated horses, the ones that tolt, these kind of Icelandics and these things. It's all for the same thing. So you take the thrust out of the horse's back so it kind of trit trots along and there's no movement in the back because it's not using its back. As simple as that. That's how you create a gated horse, by ruining its natural paces, by basically prematurely aging it by dropping its back. But this has been a wonderful tape. You've done a great job here, and I love how you're just walking out here in the stretch. I really look forward to seeing your next one. You've done a great job as a rider. Your position is developing beautifully. Your leg is already hanging down. That's what I said. And as you get better, your legs get longer the more you relax them. I always say everyone always starts with quite a short stirrup. Uh, if you know you're getting someplace when you're able to just really lengthen, that means you're getting the tension out of your legs. You never want to be gripping with your knees or gripping with your hands or gripping with anything. You don't grip to the side of the horse. You just let your body wrap around the horse, which is also why it's important that you ride a horse that is the right size for you so your legs can get around the, the bottom of the horse. If you can't, you have a hard time staying on. So all that in mind, this is Will Faber from Art to Ride. Really great job with this one. I really look forward to seeing your next one. This was a truly a transformation.